Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, ex-Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny BT, and no Benjamin Kayser again this week. But we have got a huge guest replacing him who will more than make up for Benji's absence. So we'll get him on very shortly. Um, how are you doing there, Johnny? Good, thanks, mate. Um, a few glasses of wine last night with the neighbours, so a little bit dusty this morning. Uh, was up doing the Premier Sports game for Bordeaux and Racing, which was a cracker. It was a good game. Um, but I'm not on holiday, mate. I'm not like you. A little birdie told me you've rushed home to do this from Centre Parks. How's Centre Parks going? Not a holiday, is all I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> do you like spending your time with other people's kids? No. Do I like going down one flume repetitive with my child? No. <laughs> Am I letting my missus take me to Centre Parks? No, but you're there. Yeah. So embrace it, mate. Enjoy You're a smarter it. man than me. You're a smarter man than me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, shall we talk rugby? I need a break. So um, we will get our guest on in just a minute. But first, we should have a, a very quick chat about what went on in the top 40 at the weekend. You mentioned the game that you were doing, and we'll come to yep. that in a minute. But uh, another man you know very well. Yep. It was a big day for Fulgens Udrago, wasn't it, at Montpellier? He broke Didier Best's record for the most appearances ever, 332nd. So... Give us an insight. What's he like? How important is he to Montpellier? Fufu. It's much easier to say than his whole name. <laughs> yeah. It's much easier. Um, it's just part of the furniture. Like He was obviously a skipper when I got there. There was a group that came through the clubs. There was Louis Picamol, Fufu, uh, Julien Thomas and Francois Tranduc, all really tight, came through the academy. Um, and Fufu became captain and has kind of been the epicenter of the club ever since. And I think really for anyone now, especially as a back rower, it's going to get 330-odd games in any club is ridiculous. But to do it in the top 14 where he played every game when I was there, every game, he played every Champions Cup game, then he'd go away on tour, he had six nations. I think he's got about 40 caps for France as well. So I think physically to keep yourself in that kind of nick to keep on going and then also have the longevity through all the different coaches, not get turfed out. So he's seen Fabian Galtier, he's seen Vern Cotter, he's seen Jake White, he's seen everything at that club and he's still there. So I'm not sure how many more years he's going to keep on going. We had a good chat uh, after the All Blacks game in Paris as well, where it seemed that everybody involved in French rugby, at whatever level was in Arc nightclub um, next to the Arc de Triomphe. Um, but yeah, phenomenal achievement. Uh, wonderful for him. A guy looks after everyone when they get into the club, takes care of everyone in the changing rooms and sort of sets the tone for the club. So a phenomenal achievement for him. Good. Deserves the limelight for that game, but is he a guy that will have loved the limelight or will he have just cracked up? Yeah, no, he absolutely loves the limelight. <laughs> he absolutely loves it. He's always He's been way ahead of the curve with social media and Instagram and he absolutely loves it. Um, and it'll be weird for him, I think, the strangest bit will be transitioning and, and what he does next, but but now the graph that he's put in, one club man, you will, you'll, you'll love it just now. It'll be a great celebration. They had a good party afterwards um, and you'll definitely have enjoyed it, yeah. And another man who doesn't mind a bit of the limelight, Eddie James was there at that game of the weekend, Montpellier cast. Um, yeah. Apparently apparently because of his relationship with cast coach, pierre Henry Broncom. But right. he might have been impressed by Zach Mercer, who is doing big things at the moment, isn't he? He is, he's good. I actually messaged Matthias Roland, who's the, he's the director of rugby, the sporting director um, at cast, because Eddie was sat with Matthias and Pierre-Yves Revol, who's the president. And I mentioned, I was like, has Eddie got one word of French in him, mate? Like, how's this going? for back, no, nope. <laughs> not one word. <laughs> Look, he's playing well. He was incredible pretty much every time I watched him for Bath. Uh, Montpellier's a different kettle of fish. Top 14 is trickier, but he, he's good every time I watch him. So certainly, um, Eddie might have had one eye on him at the weekend, yeah. A good weekend for Fufu, but not a good weekend for Mattia Bastereau. He ruptured the tendons in both of his knees on his return to Toulon. So, I mean, he's put a couple of messages out, but it could be career threatening, couldn't it? Oh, just so sad. Like I don't, again, Benji and I caught up with Basta after the game and so positive, ready to get back, back in training, looking fit. Um, You just, again, to do both knees. So one is obviously the surgery that hasn't held and it's buckled, but to do the other one in the same action, you just... I don't know. Like, just so sad for the guy. Um, and somebody that has been an icon of French rugby for so long. Um, you saw as well, I'm not sure if you saw the images, but when he was, was carried off the pitch, the ovation he was given by the Toulon public, just the yeah. sort of regard that he's held in globally in France for what he's done for the game. Um, and just a, like a ridiculous athlete. So good. Um, 
and as a personality as well, just like a good egg, a nice bloke. Um, so really, really sad. He's at the end of his contract with, with Leon as well. You don't know if Pierre Mignoni is gonna be a kindness for him not to finish that way and give him one more chance to get back and rehab both knees. But I mean, what a road back that's gonna be getting back from a, a double tendon rupture on both your knees. It just uh, horrible, horrible for the bloke. And you just hope the recovery goes well and that he can get back fit and happy um, and in one piece, ultimately. And he's been around for such a long time, but he's actually younger than a lot of people might think. He's only 33, which, given his transition into the back row, he could play on if he, if he comes back, couldn't he? He's only 33. He's Gif, which is becoming more and more important as a currency in French rugby. He's a monster of an athlete when he gets going. It's just, can he rehab and get back? Um, and it depends what level he wants to go to. Obviously, he's been so well looked after through his career. He's played for such huge clubs. But would he drop down and play for like a second tier side in the top 14 or, or lower end? Because somebody would give him a chance. Like somebody would give him a chance to play because he offers so much on the field. Also, as like a papa in the changing rooms. He's such a big influence on people and such a calming influence. So... Look, I really hope that's not the end for him because it'd be an incredibly sad way to go out and he 100% deserves better. And you mentioned the game you were doing, the big one on Sunday yeah. night, Racing Bordeaux. Bordeaux, 14-6 down at halftime. Yeah. <laughs> Christophe Urias, who you know, well, wasn't happy with the way some of the Racing players were acting, was he? So give us a sense of what, what comments he's made since then. And it was a hell of a comeback, wasn't it? 31 unanswered points yeah. in that second half. I think it was a combination of things. Um, Christoph's very good in the media as well, at emphasizing certain things that he has said to motivate a halftime or get the best out of people. But there were certain things on the field that were clear changes, clear changes to how they played. Um, and there was an attitude shift, but 31 on it, like they humiliated Rassin. Um, and we'll talk with our guest about what Christoph was. Um, was talking about but there's a, a little bit of unsportsmanlike conduct you call it chambrage on chambre you take okay. the mickey out of somebody um in, in french rugby uh, and teddy thomas had a little bit of a i mean i don't think it was too much but it was enough to really irk christoph um and obviously brought it up at, at halftime so there was a little bit of hand gesturing to santi cordero uh, who was phenomenal as well and obviously, there was a mind switch. There was a, a flick went off somewhere with all the players. They decided to play a completely different brand of rugby in the second half. But as you mentioned, 31 unanswered points. And I think that's the third time on the trot that they've beaten Racing at the arena, at the, that La Defense Arena in Paris, and stuck 30 plus points on them. So it's almost as like Christophe Urios has got the coaching team's number at Racing. They know how to go there, play on the synthetic field, closed roof. They've got big, abrasive. Like Ben Lamb again was absolutely sensational, getting over the game line, smashing people. Walkie coming back, carrying that form from the ABs game. Um, a real just found his confidence in himself. He comes back to top fourteen. He's just as good now. So we can be count. So look, there's certain people that are coming to a certain point in their career where they are lighting up. Christoph almost has the number of the Racing Night Two's coaching team. You could see in the way they played. They Racing couldn't contain them at all. Um, and they were phenomenal to watch. And then obviously there's the, the talking point that we'll, we'll talk about. For me, it wasn't much. Uh, I don't think our guests will have seen it as much either, but it's all over French media this week. Uh, Teddy Thomas with a little hand gesture to Santi Cordero, almost Matador-esque. It, um, no, um, it was no Dallin Armitage in the Champions Cup final, was it the one that we talk about with Benji? It was no. a, lot, a lot more subtle, but French media have gone wild over it, haven't they? Yeah, but Teddy Thomas always gets, he gets it hard. Like Gail Ficou's come out to defend him in the press and the media um, this morning in France, but Teddy Thomas, people going hard on him, whatever he does. Um, I'm not sure if it's because he looks so nonchalant when he plays, he looks so natural. Um, it almost looks easy, therefore he's not trying, therefore there must be something about his personality or his characteristics. But like compared to the Delon example, which was uh, like condescending, I took this more as like a, come on, let's, it was almost like a matador, come on, let's get it on, like a a duel between two wingers, which was almost fun to watch. Like they were trying to engage each other or he was trying to engage his opposite man who we'll chat to in a minute. So for me, it wasn't that bad. Um, and when you compare that to the Delon example or the unsportsmanlike stuff, you see like people after penalties, rubbing, rubbing faces, tapping people on the back of the head, you know, condescending stuff. This was nowhere near the same level. So it'd be interesting to see our guest take on it. Um, but I enjoyed it. It was, a, it was a great game of rugby. 
Right, we've made the listeners wait long enough. Let's get our guest on now and we can have a chat with the man who scored a hat-trick in that 37-14 win for Bordeaux over Racing. Argentina international Santi Cordero joins us. How are you? Hi, how are you guys? We're good, we're good. Um, pretty good day at the office in Paris. Um, wasn't going so well in the first half, so what did Christophe say at half time? Because there's been some comments in the media afterwards he wasn't happy about some of the way the wrestling players were acting did he use that to motivate you it was very tough the first half but we weren't playing like our 100 percent, and they were just winning by nine points i can remember but we were i think i told the guys we we're respecting the guys too much we need to start just start playing and we were passing the ball a lot just go for the one-on-one and they're gonna be pretty tired after after us running onto them so yeah Christophe said, said the same we are like uh, uh, timid like we're shy mm. so let's let's go play hard work, work hard and then everything happens after and it certainly did like the, the way you got Ben Lamb onto the ball Cameron Walkie destructive in defense like you completely changed on field the way you wanted to play and that was clear that clip of Teddy Thomas has been doing the rounds on social media. For me, it didn't look like there was much in it at all. Did you even react or notice at the time? Or looking back on it now, what did you make of it? No, yeah, I agree with you. For me, it was nothing. Just anyone can do whatever they want on the, on the, on the field. Uh, it's not, I didn't take it any personal. Just I wanted to, to keep on pushing myself to just beat them. Uh, and thank God we did because if not, it was going to be a shame. So yeah, I, I honestly I didn't care about that. I'm not I'm not very a very personal guy, so it's it's all good. And l- rugby is always a good leveler. Like people ask me, like, can you be arrogant during rugby games or can you get ahead of yourself? Like, you can't at all. Like one hand gesture and a try. Next minute, you score three tries and they get pumped by thirty points. Like, <laughs> it's yeah. so Anything- quick to change. Yeah. Yeah, you can do anything you want and anything can happen also at the same time. So that's what I like about rugby. And Johnny, you know Christoph as well. Aside yeah. from what he said after the game about a level of disrespect or tra- treat, harassing players, treating Bordeaux players like mugs or however it gets badly translated over here, is he one between the two of you to chuck the teacups at halftime? What, Santi, was he, was he going mad at halftime or was he calm? Uh, his tone, his tone of voice is 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 weird because he, he he's a very strong tone when he talks. So you, you you don't know if he's angry or he's just yeah encouraging us to to play better. Uh, but yeah, he was kind of both at the same time. So, but but we knew we had to play better and just we we went for it. <laughs> but he's always he's a really passionate guy. Um, so yeah. he was my he was my coach when I was at Cast. Um, he's a very passionate man, and he's always trying to get the best out of people. And whether that is tactically or technically, what can we change? Can we keep the ball in hand? Should we stop kicking it away? Be more threatening? He also doesn't mind reading a riot act to try and like give a sort of an electro shot, like a jolt, like come on, let's change something. And, and that could be at halftime. That could be. Remember, we went, to, we went to La Rochelle, and Richie Gray and I turned up for breakfast at the wrong time, and he took everyone out of breakfast and started throwing water bottles off walls outside the La Rochelle hotel room just to try and get a, like a rise out of people and to sort of shock them and to look, there's a game, we're here to do something, let's do this properly um, and a change of attitude. So look, he's now one of the most respected coaches in France. Um, he's loved by French media, like they, on Canal Plus at the weekend, they talked about him for 15, 20 minutes. Sebastian Chabal was declaring his love for Christophe, saying he wants to get his boots back on and play for him. So look, he's, he's loved over here. And, and Bordeaux, like Santi, you're part of it, but Bordeaux now after being a team that had never made the playoffs the past three seasons under Christoph, you've been incredibly consistent. So yeah, again, you must find them great to work with. Yeah, of course. I, I arrived at the same time with uh, Christoph from, from England. Um, I didn't know him at, this, at, at first, but he's a really good guy. He, he knows everything. He has been through a lot. So yeah, I really like him. And I think Bordeaux like, loves him a lot. I think everyone, everyone's telling me after the game, oh, please tell him to resign. We need more of him. I'm, I'm just a player. But yeah, yeah, I like him. I'm, I'm very comfortable with him. Um, well, let's see what happens now. Did he, um, I meant to ask you as well, did he, 
like the, the year that I left cast, you decided to do orienteering with the players. So they got to know cast better. I was wondering if they did that with Bordeaux. Like when you arrived, there was one of your team buildings, you get sent around to different parts of Bordeaux to explore it. Did he do that with you guys as well? Or is that just cast? Uh, well, we, we try, what is good, what was good with, with him is we try to find something to relate with, with the city. So we start like going to vineyards and what's Bordeaux like. We need to find something like to, to, to rep that represents us. And we try to go with the wine and with some stuff. And we start doing a lot of uh, team buildings around the vineyards, just preparing the wine. It was the same at Cast. It was, it was different because aren't the vineyards. You have to go to Gaillac, which isn't exactly the same as Bordeaux. But you would have, as you had Pierre Faber, was the big sponsor. It was all about pharmaceuticals. So all of like the, the back starter moves were like the different chemicals that Pierre Faber would use. So you'd understand what the big sponsor was using in the fabrication of the products. You'd sort of identify for, identity for the, the like it was really weird how he tapped into things and, and made you think about the city you're representing. And I've heard it's the exact same in Bordeaux. Yeah. So it's really cool. Yeah, yeah. How have you felt, again, moving from Argentina, Exeter, how have you found Bordeaux as a city? Because it's, it's a wonderful city to live in. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, we're very happy here with my wife. So I, I'm, we are in, a, in a, an apartment in, 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 uh, in the center town. I'm, I'm just trying to talk to her. Well, we can go into a house, having some garden. No, no, no way. I'm staying here. I don't care what you say. You can go. I'm going to stay here in Bordeaux. I love it. So, yeah, that's that's how happy am I. If she's happy, it's good. So I don't care. Bordeaux sounds great, but Christoph has definitely upped his game since he knew you, Johnny, because vineyards sound a lot better than orienteering. I don't know if it's just me. He's got his own one now too. So he's got Chateau, Pes is it Pesuc? Chateau Pesuc. Yeah, he has, a, he has a, some wines. I, honestly, I, I'm on the same page with you. I'm not very good at that. But he has a couple of uh, white wines, red wines. Oh, I'm, I'm not very good, but yes, yes, he's he's uh, he's going through that way to rugby and wine. Does he bring them into training? Does no, he bring his wines? No, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. He doesn't. He doesn't mix the 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 rugby with the with the with the wine with his job. You mentioned loving life in Bordeaux, Santi, and obviously moving from Exeter. Just give us a bit of insight into the differences between the two. And also, that move must have been quite difficult to make because you're a real fan favourite down in Devon. So moving to Bordeaux, it must have been a tough decision. Yeah, it was tough because I wanted to stay in, in Exeter, uh, to be honest. Uh, I loved life there in Devon. Uh, we were very happy there, but sometimes doesn't happen the way you want uh, but I just came into another amazing club amazing city life is amazing so I'm I'm super happy I'm, I've got very lucky with that sometimes you go somewhere you don't you don't like it or you don't want to or then you you start like figuring out what what you want for your future and all the stuff but I think I, I got lucky because here life in Bordeaux is amazing and uh, I can't complain, to be fair. Very quickly on Exeter, did you have something to do with your brother signing there? Did you help him? Did you pick up the phone to Rob Baxter and get him that contract? Or how did that work? No, no, no. I just, he, he was struggling in Argentina. Um, he called me, Santi, I just, I want to go play outside. Can you give me a hand? And I just called my agent. I told him, look, my brother wants to go and play. He's good. And I, we, I put them in contact and he was the guy, the, the one who just called all the class and Rob was, wanted him. I just put him in contact with my agent. That's all. And in general terms, how have you found the contrast? So obviously you've played pretty much in most leagues in the world now, but how do you find specifically the difference between premiership rugby and top 14 rugby? What are your big differences between the two you've noticed? Uh... Apart from the weather. Well, I think, yeah. Well, I think here in France is uh, the tournament is more difficult because you can win or you can lose any game at any time. You never know. You can lose against the last away. Or, for example, last season, Bayon beat Toulouse at Toulouse. So you never know. It's, it's, it's amazing. And in Premiership, there's, there's not that thing. 
sometimes you you know who's going to win and uh um, i think that's that's the, what i like the surprises uh anything can happen is a really long tournament and that that's that's the, the big difference but i just love both tournaments it's it's i was lucky to play both and just experience what was it like so i just i'm happy for that and johnny mentioned the job christoph urias has done turning border around i mean you're you're flying at the moment and you had a really good season last season the season before that when the pandemic first hit and it was cancelled you guys were absolutely flying top of the league mm. how difficult was that to kind of when you heard that the league was going to be cancelled to kind of put that away in a box somewhere and move on and and what did Christoph say because it really did look like you guys were going to have a massive tilt of the title that season yeah it was it was really tough because we we have a really good team um we were first like you said um but we were talking since the the covid start we have to adapt because of the positive uh, cases and all the stuff we will adapt we we are human beings we need to adapt and every time was like we have one case we can't play this weekend or we have to start training in groups by four or this weekend or this week we you can't come to the club so it was all about just mental mental strength and just adapting at, with no time so it was all about that and trying to be fit for and ready to play we never knew if we were going to play in two days or maybe in four so it was all about that and just we don't care what's going to happen we're going to go we're going to put our best and we're going to try to win it was all about that just live in the moment and see what happens so moving on from that season last season was obviously difficult as well for other reasons like you lost the top 14 semi-final and then lost the champions cup semi-final yeah and so what do you and i know christoph like this will eat at him having got to that stage in both competitions as a group, what are the messages that he's tried to put over? Like, as he said, look, it's a learning curve. This year we'll go one step better and, and we'll learn. Like, what are the learnings that you have taken from those two losses? And what do you think will be the things that will push you on? Because the way it's looking in top 14, you're obviously going to be there at playoff time. Um, but when it gets to playoff rugby, what are the little things that Christoph looks to tweak or you think you want to change so you can go one step and win one of these competitions? Well, yeah, he was trying to talk about learning stuff for the for the future because we never arrived there. Bordeaux never arrived to a semi final and all the stuff. Uh, we were trying to. Well, he was talking about like like the the game plan and just doing our game plan against a, a good team, um, just trying to adapt when something happens uh, on the on the the game. And I think this is something we are working now this week because we're playing against Toulouse and we lost the two semifinals again against them. Uh, we're just trying to prepare our work, our game plan at our best and just follow it and see what happens. But we just need to stuck at it. Uh, our little leaders have to just guide us through and everyone has to work hard. Not 100%, 130% because it's going to be very tough. And you had an Exeter as well, because for ages, Exeter were towards the top of the league and it was that final hurdle to overcome it. I mean, normally it was Saracens in the final, but that's another story. Um, but it is that that final hurdle is is difficult to overcome, isn't it? Often it's mental. So has he, I know it's only one season and the season before you were, you were flying as well when it was cut short, but... Has there been a focus on the mental side of things and, and overcoming that final hurdle? It's very soon in Bordeaux's evolution, I suppose, compared to when you were at Exeter and you had a number of finals on the trot. But has there been a focus on the mental side of things? <clears throat> yeah, I think I think the, the mental is very important for the, for the rugby. But what I like it from Exeter is the, the mentality of the boys and how Rob, talk through through it to the to the boys. Uh, when I arrived, the boys were like, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get a home semifinal. We don't care how we're gonna do it. It's, it's like they were just taking it for for granted. We're we're doing it in the season didn't start. It's like we're gonna do it because we were gonna work hard. We're gonna smash them and we're gonna just go for it. So that's that was amazing. They were like acting like winners. 
and uh, I learned a lot from that because they they were very confident on 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 what they wanted. And uh, well, every time, well, not every time, but when we lost a couple of finals, yeah, it was tough, but they were there. We were there, just a couple of points. Maybe we something we could change, but just the 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 hunger of just going for another cup, another another trophy, it just was was crazy. And when I left, they just became champions of uh, of the European and Premiership. Not bad. Do you you built the foundation, Santi? No. <laughs> Yes, man. And also, it's a real possibility that Bordeaux could do the same. Let's be honest. The way they're playing and the draw you've got in Europe as well, um, could so without looking too far ahead, what do you think is going to have to be that little bit different? Obviously, you've got Antoine Dupont, Roman Intermac this weekend in Toulouse. Mathieu Jalibar, I think, is back from the beach in Dubai. He had his week off last week and that he missed that game against Racing. So it'd be good to have him back. What do you think is going to be the key in winning this game this weekend? Because I think you've lost the last three or four consecutive games to Toulouse. Yeah. What will be the difference on the field this weekend? Well, I think it's going to be uh, our racks. We need to, to, to work hard on our racks on attack because they have uh, big players and they just go for the ball. We need to have the ball. Also, we need to... to to work on the on the on the kick chase on the high balls, put them on pressure. We were talking about that, and uh, also we just need to win the kicking battle with the, with the, the kicking game. We need to try to play at their at their in goal the most we can, and just make them uh, make them the, the the errors, the mistakes, so we can start playing there. Put three points, line more, maybe five seven points. We just need to put them the pressure. And uh, also maybe it's uh, is the way we play. I think last game against Racing will give us a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of trust on us. So maybe we can we can start playing a lot more and play the one on one because we were good there, and hopefully we can put them in danger. But it sounds like as well. I think like what Tim just touched on. If you have that one win over them with this group of players, will be that mental breakthrough you all need. So yeah, and I think it'll yeah, also think, make it, yeah. it'll make the league much more interesting to know that you guys can beat to lose. That meant if you meet each other at, at knockout time, like who knows what could happen. That could be the big step. So it's a massive game for you this weekend. I wish you guys really well. It's huge for you. Yeah, yeah. Like, like I said, if we, we, we beat, uh, we got 31 <laughs> nil on the second half to Racing. It just, it's, it was good for, for our head. So now we, get, we need to use that against Toulouse. Um, We'll see what happens. If we win them, if we beat them, it's going to be really good for us, yeah, mentally. And Johnny mentioned him there, Matthew Jalibert. He signed a, I imagine, massive new contract recently. So firstly, has he bought a new car? Is he rocking around like a superstar now? Um, and secondly, what's he like to play with? Because he, he comes across as very cool and calm. So um, what's he like? Yeah, no, he, he he's, a, he's a young guy, but... His confidence is, is it's high. It's good. It's good for for for, for us because we know he could do anything from nowhere. So so it, it's good. Sometimes we're struggling and he starts running and we have to follow him to follow him. Uh, but uh, he's he's a really nice guy and uh, I, he didn't bought anything for the moment. So. No Lamborghini, no Ferrari. No no nothing nothing yet. <laughs> Uh, I will tell you if I see something different, but <laughs> no, no, he's, he's a really nice guy and he just worked hard for the, for the team. And uh, I really appreciate that. And um, no flash cars, but I know he's got some dogs. I don't know if you've met them, but I heard a rumor one of them is called Owen after Owen Farrell. Tell me it's not true. I don't know, honestly. I have no <laughs> idea. But I, I almost, I almost killed one of his dogs. Okay. Oh, was, wow. He, he was doing a barbecue at his house, and I just walked. I was walking, and one of the dogs ran through me, and he just fell onto the pool. And I thought, I thought he knew how to swim, but then Matthew jumped into the into the pool, tried to save okay. him. He wasn't. He wasn't shouting Owen at the time. No, no, no. no. <laughs> but I, I'm going to ask him. I, I have no idea the names of the dogs, but I would ask him. We'll have to get you on again and check. <laughs> when you start yeah. off that story with, I almost killed his dog. 
we were at a barbecue. I was like, oh no, I don't know where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he fell up to the pool. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Man, that's crazy. Um, we just wanted to ask you about Argentina as well, because you were in action this autumn for them. And um, it's a hell of a stat. You've played 21 consecutive away tests and you haven't played in Argentina for over two years. So how tough has that period been internationally for Argentina? Very, very tough. Uh, it's not It's not nice because we're always away in hotels with other family, without our fans, our people. Uh, so yeah, we were at the same, uh, first time, at first we didn't want it to put it uh, as an excuse, but the second year it was really, really tough because it was like the same, same thing, staying away. Uh, we could imagine how a game could it be in Argentina uh, with our old people. It just gave us a lot of energy just to play. And uh, for example, this, this last tour, I saw the guys very tired from just, I don't know if it was traveling or, or, or all the games, but it's mentally, it's not, it's not very nice for, for, for us. And physically, of, of course, too. But it was, it was uh, pretty tough these last two, two years. Uh, but I think next season is going to be, we, we're going to be able to play in Argentina. So that's, that's going to be good. I mate, randomly, so now everyone's back over in Europe playing. Jaguarez, what is the player's preference? Would you got, because I've got this tradition of playing with Argentinian players that goes back 10, 15 years of playing in Glasgow, playing in Montpellier. We had half the Argentinian team and it was phenomenal. And it was great because you're good fun, you're good people and really enjoyable. But what is your preference? Would you like to see Jaguarez as a team continue, but then have a blend of people playing in Europe or all of one or all of that, like what's, what's the ideal blend for you guys as a nation and for players? Cause obviously it's impossible to be touring the entire time or you must feel incredibly far spread, but what would be the best blend for Argentinian rugby for you guys to perform to the best level possible? Well, this is my opinion, uh, but I think the best for Argentina would be to have a, a professional just tournament to play like super rugby was at that time. We need a, a professional team in Argentina that plays uh, a professional rugby for the just for the for the young guys that just start building their their career and start. They need to start playing somewhere because if not, they will never like play at, on a high level. Uh, we need to 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 have that, and then. You can choose if you want to play outside, uh, but you need to start somewhere. And I think that that somewhere is is in Argentina with a professional rugby team, um, like it was with with uh, Jaguares. But yeah, it's it's very tough. I'm not, I'm not uh, very political, and I don't know what's going on. If we're gonna find some some answer to that, but I think that would be the best, just to 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 have a some young players to playing there. Also, we have some, some good players, old players that want to play in Argentina because, I don't know, family, friends, uh, they don't care about traveling. Uh, but it's, it's just, I think we need that to, to, to be a, a, a good team. It's tough, isn't it, Johnny? Because they did well in Super Rugby as well. And, and it is yeah, political well. factors and, and external factors that means they're not, not there anymore. And we'll probably only know the impact in a few years time, I guess, but um, the Haguara is not being in Super Rugby. It could be a big blow, couldn't it? Huge, but but also it's the player potential that Argentina has. So for, for two decades of professional rugby, you guys have supplied teams like my teammates in Glasgow, Montpellier, like my team was Augustin Crevy, Juan Fagalo, Maxi Bustos, Martin Bustos Moyano, Santi Fernandez, like it was phenomenal. We had half the Argentinian side. When I was in Glasgow, it was Bernardo Stortoni. We had Francisco Lionelli, uh, Federico Martin Arambu. Like you've been everywhere, but it's incredibly hard to spend your entire calendar year away from home and then regroup and do one week's preparation and play test matches. Yeah, It's impossible. And you think of all the different federations. If you're a French road player, you play in Montpellier and you go up to Paris and you have a camp. Or if you're 
if you're Scottish, you go to Murrayfield, it's a 40 minute drive. It's so easy to perform because you're in a little bubble and it's easy. Everything is done for you. But for these guys, it's incredibly hard. So I think that the ideal scenario would be that you had that de developmental team that was part of Super Rugby bringing through young kids because the player numbers you have in Argentina are huge. You develop so many talented young kids, so they have to develop and be part of something. But then you also shouldn't be penalized if for financial reasons or for an experience or cultural reason, you want to go and experience your rugby in the UK or France, or you want to go and play for the Crusaders. Like you should be able to go and be selective to the national team wherever you are. And ultimately those, those touring experiences, those different club experiences that, you know, Fernandez Lobby's had, that Mario Desmos had, that you've had of going away and experiencing different cultures and different ways of playing rugby will be beneficial for Argentinian rugby as well. So like I'm with you, I think if you get that blend right and there's that base of talent getting nurtured and, and brought through and then the best can go away and, and pick up a paycheck elsewhere, like Argentinian rugby is going to be monstrous over the next five, 10 years because you develop so many good rugby players. And we spoke about Christoph Urias as a, as a coach. Um, Johnny, you were coached by Mario Ledesma as well. So Santi, what, what is he like? Are they, are they similar, Christoph and Mario? Uh, yes, yes, they're the similar. With they, they put a lot of pressure on, not pressure, but they they put. How, how do I say this in English? Uh, they they want the, the best from for, from the players, so they push them hard to to get the, to that level, and and it's really good. Uh, sometimes sometimes it's not the best because we you start arguing. For for example. I had a, a couple of fights with Christoph because he was pushing me so hard, uh, but I, I was injured or something like that. I can't do anything. But but yeah, they're, they're similar and uh, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting because we we're not having the results we want with Argentina, but but I think we we're gonna get there. We just need some this this pause. It's gonna be really good for us. So, so we can start our next uh, tour in July, is it? July? A little bit fresh with some weeks off. I think it's going to be different, yeah. And you know them both, Johnny. It sounds like from what Santi's saying, quite a lot of mind games from both Christoph and, and Mario. They know how to kind of dig into a player's psyche. Yeah, Mario was a very young coach when I had him. Um, but I was actually really impressed. Again, I haven't spoken to him since 2014, but I was really impressed with the way the Argentinian side played against France in the Autumn Nation series, just like different strategic things and tactical things that before I maybe thought he wouldn't be aware of, but because he'd worked with Fabien Galtier, he knew how to operate against Fabien Galtier. So, so like interesting things behind the scenes of how he operates. But again, like you said, like very driven, wants to succeed, wants to get the best out of people um, and puts pressure on you to do, to do that. Um, so again, not too dissimilar. It was strange for me as well, because Mario was an assistant coach. He was just forwards. So I didn't get to see when you have that overall power and you're, you're controlling an organization and an environment. It's very different when you're the head coach. And that's where Christoph Urios has been so good with Cast, Oyanax and, and Bordeaux. So look, two young guys, two hookers, two nuggety forwards, um, trying to do their best. And, and again, they're, they're doing good things with their sides. Um, like you said, it would be unfortunate for Mari who come under pressure, but everything's been stacked up against the amount of travel, COVID, it can't have been easy um, and they'll just be looking forward to rest. So like you said, next year will be a litmus test for them. What can they do in their summer tour uh, with one eye looking ahead to 2023, like getting all their troops together and having a real tilt at the World Cup. And just quickly, while we're on Argentinian rugby, all the news in the last week in international rugby has been about the eligibility laws and it's kind of divided opinion a bit. But I've seen some comments saying, you know, it's great for Pacific Island teams, but a country like Argentina, not just Argentina, the other South American nations, Chile, Uruguay, they've got entirely sort of homegrown squads and this law isn't going to kind of benefit them in any way. So have you got a view on it, Santi, the new eligibility ruling? No, I have no opinion, honestly. I'm not, I don't know if you know uh, Matias Moroni. He has yeah. a lot of opinions, but I just, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's good. It's good for the, for the, for some players. For, for example, uh, I, I play with uh, Seta Tamanivalu and uh, he just played in, in, in New Zealand for the Crusaders. Uh, he's Fijian and he was super happy that he had the, the chance to play for, for, for Fiji too, because he's, it's, he's from there. 
Um, I mean, if, if it's, if they have that option, good for them. Uh, it's going to be much, much tougher yeah, for, for us to beat them. But yeah, I'm just, I don't, I don't care a lot. Of, I'm not very political, as I say. I just want to play rugby. It's a complicated situation, isn't it, Johnny? But um, yeah. work works for some, doesn't for others. And um, we'll see where it goes. There's, it, there's going to be more news on it, I think, in the months to come, isn't there? 100%. And it's going to be really interesting. We talk about Argentina. Uh, we talk about the Pacific Isles and New Zealand and people have been capped. But then Six Nations countries as well, like the ramifications of EQP. Can everyone now that's in England say, I'm no longer South African, I take back my caps and I want to try and play for England? And then the salary cap, all, all shifts in England towards all these guys that want to be English. Like, I don't know. It's, it's a massive call from World Rugby to make this shift. It's going to really help, obviously, those PI nations. But I think the ramifications um, are going to be huge in British rugby, especially. They're going to be massive. Um, and I have no idea, for instance, the Six Nations, I reckon we could see 10, 12, 15 new players that we didn't know were Irish, Welsh, English stepping up and, and playing. So it's going to be a really weird few months. And I know... Not that I'm going to name names, but my phone has been ringing off the hook with people in France wanting to contact different people and different coaches to try. So it's going to be a really interesting few months. And for that board that decides in World Rugby, they're going to have so many cases. Like, I have no idea how they're going to decide what the criteria is going to be and who gets to decide who's the judge, what countries get help or what individuals get help. Like, I've got no idea and I wouldn't want it to be my job. So good luck to them. But it's going to be an interesting few months in the rugby politics which doesn't interest me either santi so there we go that makes two of us <laughs> you mean to say there's lots of people with scottish grandparents getting in touch saying you got gregor's mate, number <laughs> we get everywhere mate <laughs> <laughs> and for you personally santi obviously you're loving life in bordeaux at the moment you've got many good years ahead of you but um do you want to stay in france do you want to, if if the haguaris wow. did reform would that's you want to a go very back? good question <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's a uh, it's something i talk with my wife every day every day um, um the answer is i have no idea what i'm gonna do after <laughs> um i know i'm gonna play here in france for a couple of years but then i don't know if i want to try something different uh very tough very tough having kids changing a lot of countries and all the stuff i just i'm going step by step have no no idea what's going to happen take each day as it comes you you might end up in 10 years time like johnny living in the south of france who knows maybe <laughs> who, who knows um johnny mentioned it earlier on the champions cup kicking off next weekend after another big game for you this weekend but um it's difficult isn't it competing on two fronts you did it last season got to the semi-finals of both um how tricky is it? Because top 14 clubs historically have sometimes favoured the top 14 and Europe hasn't been a priority. Clearly for Bordeaux, you want to compete on both fronts. So how tough is that to, to do both? It's, it's difficult because you need to, sometimes you need to, to, to see if you have the, the, the players to, to, to play both tournaments. If you, know, you don't know if you are going to have a lot of injuries and all, all, all the stuff, but we're not thinking on a on a long way. We just want to beat Toulouse, and then we're gonna figure out what's gonna happen next week. But we, we we talk about we put some objectives and we 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 wanna we wanna get through the both both of the tournaments. So I think we we need to. It's gonna be some tough weeks for us because we have Toulouse, we have Leicester. Then we have Scarlet, and then we have the we have a Christmas, and we have to play games in Christmas. So it's, 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 it's going to be very very tough physically, mentally, and uh, we'll see. I would love to have this conversa conversation in in a month and see what what I can tell you. The rugby is coming thick and fast. We wish you the best of luck in both the top fourteen and the Champions Cup, and um, yeah, come back on. Tell us in future. About, about both also <laughs> what matches Jalabert's dogs called and try not to kill any of them in the meantime <laughs> <laughs> thanks for coming on Santi thank you thank you for everything thanks a lot mate good luck this weekend against Toulouse 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, great to have the man of the moment on um, and given us a bit of insight into various things. Tough for him to comment as a current player on some things, but um, good to have him on. Yeah, doesn't want to give too much away, obviously. Um, but he's just awesome to watch. Like oh, His English is amazing as well, but Bordeaux are absolutely flying. They operate really well as a team, but the back line they've got and the way they finish things, for me, there's them and Toulouse. So it'll be huge this weekend, but he is part of a really, really decent outfit. Um, and he's absolutely flying. The game at the weekend, he was immense. And, he, and he's a good bloke to boot as well. So look, he's enjoying his time in Bordeaux. He's just re-signed. And I think they'd be daft to let him go, <laughs> really, the way he's playing. I think Ben Lamb looks like he's leaving. Looks like he signed for Montpellier, um, which will be a big hole to fill for Christophe, finding a big abrasive winger like Ben Lamb on the market. But Santi offers something completely different, like breaking ankles, sidestep, footwork. Um, and create something out of nothing. So, like, great to have him on uh, and a great bloke as well. I don't know to preempt it, but he might just feature in this next <laughs> bit as well. <laughs> it's about time we did our meter moment of the week, isn't it? So, there's no one to argue with your choice this week either. No Benji. So, take it away, Johnny. No Benji to mess it up. So, meter <laughs> moment of the weekend, best rugby moment of the weekend is 100% Santi's hat trick at the weekend. I'm not sure if you caught it on highlights, Tim, but. Again, completely dominant performance, second half performance, which was insane from Bordeaux at Racing um, and Santi with a hat trick. The best of his tries. I'm not sure if you saw the best one. Lionel Messi esque skills. Absolutely. Messi esque. Ballon d'Or. He should have one in rugby and he'd, he'd win that as well. That, the meter moment of the week is the Ballon d'Or of rugby. There we go, Tim. We've thrown it together. <laughs> um, but again, outside the 22, manages to pick the ball off the deck, grubber through, sees nobody at home, pick the ball off himself, goes through untouched. Um, so meter moment of the weekend this week is Santi Cordero's hat trick against Racing. That was Johnny's meter moment of the week. And meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer. And they've made over 9 million cooks better with their revolutionary app as well. So it's no surprise their users are growing rapidly every day. If you've ever said your pork or turkey's dry, then meter is for you. And you can use it on a barbecue, in the oven or in a pan. Enter a whole new world of cooking and join the metaverse at meter.com. Just use the code FRENCHPOD10 at checkout for 10% off any full price item as well. Let's have a quick look ahead to the coming weekend in the top 14 before we go then. And we've already mentioned it a couple of times. The big one, Santis Bordeaux against Toulouse, Johnny. How do you see it going? Oh, it's difficult because mates with quite a few of the Toulouse boys. Look, Toulouse have had this period of dominance now for three years over them. And I think for... Christoph Urios, it'll be a huge bugbear because he doesn't really have too much time for Ugo Mola either. Um, <laughs> so he'll be infuriated the fact that they've lost the last run of three or four games against them. I think for the league as well, it would just be great to have Bordeaux get one over so we get to playoff time and you don't know um, what's going to happen. Bordeaux have almost looked a little bit timid in the games they've played against Toulouse in the past, which is really strange. And so you sort of get the feeling if they can have a little bit of a mental flick and perform the way they did in that second half against Racing against Toulouse this weekend, um, you could have a real battle. So, look, I think it would be great for the game and great for French rugby if Bordeaux could win that one this weekend. And down the other end of the table, Stade Francais, 12th now, and they yeah. host La Rochelle. So that's big for them and big for Gonzalo Casada as well. Is he under pressure? Uh, it's a strange one with Stade Francais because they started last season in the same manner. Um, they sort of spluttered and didn't really ignite into life until about 10 games from the end where they run six on a trot and then they get into the playoffs. So you just don't know what's going to happen. They were disappointing last weekend. They played down in Biarritz in a monsoon, which could have gone either way. That was a coin toss. Um, but it just doesn't get any easier. The fixtures just keep coming thick and fast. Um, and La Rochelle is not a side that you want to be playing against at the minute. They are just more and more impressive. Every game you watch, they seem to add another layer to the game. Uh, and Ron O'Gara really seems to be stepping up the plate and changing things or adding to what they'd already done, which was superb over the past couple of seasons. So it doesn't get any easier. I think for Biritz, they've already come out in the press and said, look, we're down that end of the table. We are in a relegation scrap now with Biritz, with Breve, with Perpignan, with Poe, and it's not going to be easy. So they've got the calibre, they've got the firepower, they've got the players to get them out of this zone, um, but they need to start winning quick. And, and having La Rochelle at home, is not one that you, 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 it's not one you want to lose. It's a huge game and La Rochelle have been decent away and at home that this is this year. So it doesn't get any easier for them. 
and it wouldn't be a week in the top four team without transfer rumours or big transfer news. So is Trevor Nayakane joining Racing? Looks like he is. Imminently, it looks like. Um, I know Big Census Johnson's been flying up and down on a consulting basis trying to help them with a scrum because it's been shaky. Um, but it looks like Nyaki has signed f- in the next few weeks, he will arrive once visa and everything's clear and he signed for three years. It also looks like they're trying to sign Paolo Tafili from Toulouse, who's a tight head there, who's been playing behind Charlie Farmina, who's talented as well. And they also they're bringing in Anton Bresler from Worcester, which is left field and a Namibian lock, who also played at Edinburgh. So there's loads going on. Um, but Racing, again, they just look rattled and unsure, especially up front. So they're going to look to reinforce, I would say, as quickly as they can. Arthur Vincent announced he's signing two more years at Montpellier. Morgan Parra, it seems, finally has rejected contract offers from Claremont. So he is apparently looking at Toulon, Toulouse and Stade Francais. And his halfback partner, Camille Lopez, who had signed a pre-contract with Biarritz, has just reneged on it. So hes I don't know how he's going to get out of this, but the president of Biarritz came out in the press down here this week and was absolutely livid. Um, even more so if he goes to Bayonne. So there was rumours he was going to Toulon to to, look up, to hook up with uh, Frank Azema, but possibly he might be ditching Biarritz for neighbours Bayonne, which is, I mean, there's two kilometres between the two sides, so it'd be a crazy move to make, but apparently that's what's on the cards. Could be a spicy derby next season if they're both in the same league and if that move does happen. It always is, but that's it. Added spice, added layers of spice in this area as well, like Biarritz and Bayonne, two of the biggest rivals in French rugby, so... I think he might get a few digs if he does end up signing for Bayonne. We'll see. Thanks, Johnny. A massive thanks to Santi Cordero for joining us as well. And thanks to all you guys for listening. Make sure you hit subscribe. Leave us a nice review as well if you can. Check us out on Rugby Pass as well as on YouTube. And we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, Johnny. Cheers, Tim. Bye.